to Watch the Revolution show, a show for men and the people who love them, where we discuss how people can find and embrace the revolution within themselves. I am your host, Dr. Charles Corporal. What's good, revolutionaries? As we say, I hope all is well, and that you are making your way in the world. It is a joyful thing to make your way in the world, revolutionaries, to find your space, to find your peace, right? To find your solace, to find where you are pushing the envelope in your life, in your community, in your families, wherever you need to push, because that's what revolution is about. We have to figure out how we transform ourselves. And as my good friend Thomas Drew at One in One Life says, that our revolution should be a beacon for someone else. That what we do in the world is not only for us. Our transformation is not for us revolutionaries. It is for others to see, to say, you know what? I can look, I can see, and I can answer that question, what's your revolution? I can go out and build a better version of myself. I can go out and build a better version of my community. I can go out and build a better version of the world. And I'm so happy to be able to do this show with you and to be able to bring amazing people on my show. And as you can see here, there's an amazing human, right? And that's going to be our theme today. There's an amazing human on the screen with me. And I am fortunate. I have, you know, I lived revolutionaries in New Orleans for 15 years and I got to meet some of the most revolutionary people who I can also call friends. And as I told you, you heard me talk at length that New Orleans is a breeding ground for revolutionary leaders. It was my training ground. It allowed me to be this version of myself, to be revolutionary, to bring this show to you. And uh, on my way, I got to meet this good, good brother, right? This, this good, good brother, my good friend, my dear friend, my dear brother, doctor, right? We're we, we, we going to call him, you know, this luminary, Dr. David Robinson Morris, right? You know, and, and David, because that's what he said. That's what he said. David. David is the CEO of the Reimagine Lucian. I, I got to say it with my eyes closed just so I can, I, I, I can get out. This brother has done so much. This brother has done so much. Former uh, professor at Xavier University in, in New Orleans, uh, Center for Center for, I'm going to say diversity, equity, and inclusion, but it was it was so, so much more um, what you were doing. Now, just a luminary in the field around diversity, equity, and inclusion, but also a dear friend of mine. I want to say hello and thank you to the, thank you for coming on the show and being a part of this journey with me. My dear friend, how are you? I am well, Charles. I am well. Thank you for the invitation. It's always a good time with Dr. Charles Corker. So I am happy <laughs> to be here. Uh, and chat with you today, like we always do, uh, about about these issues and things. Yeah, no doubt. And I, and I just want to give some credence. You know, you know, you think about this. Your work is really centered around the intersections of imagination. That that's really mm -hmm. interesting. Imagination, policy, practice, and prophetic hope to radically mm -hmm. reimagine diversity, equity, and inclusion toward racial justice and systematic systemic transformation by engendering freedom of the human spirit. That's a whole lot there, brother, right? Yeah. That, that freedom of the human spirit. And we'll get into this uh, a little bit. But dear brother, I, I've got to ask you my signature question. Yeah. What's, what's your revolution? That's a great, great signature question, as you very well know. That is, you just read a little bit of it, right? It's a, it is, um, I tell people that I was put on this earth to F things up in the best way possible and to bring people into the fullness of themselves, right? That is the revolution, uh, to live whole, full human lives, right? With all that that encompasses, with some gratitude, some joy, and a whole lot of imagination. Uh, I, I take that from, from Tony Morrison and Beloved, who says that uh, the only grace you can have is the grace you can't imagine, right? Mm. If, you can't, if you can't imagine it, you can't have it. That's why the imagination is so important. Mm. Uh, man, the, 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 the imagination of that. I, I want to pull back because there's so, there's so much in that. Right. Like the, the beginning part of that is that you want to F things up, right? <laughs> right. You want to F things up. What does that mean? Like you want to F things up, like the status quo. I mean, give me, give me something that you're trying to F up, you know, that's going to lead us to hope and, 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 and the fullness of the fullness of the human spirit. What are you trying yeah. to F up these days? 
There's there's a lot of them, right? There's um there's as you very well know, there's systemic inequities, right? So I'm doing some work in um uh, the criminal legal system here in town, doing work in education and higher education in particular. Uh, I've just taken a, a part-time position as the new executive director of a national nonprofit, the Center for Contemplative Mind and Society, um, that is working to infuse higher education in particular with contemplative practice, um, right, to help folks uh, transform themselves before you can transform anything else. Mm, you have yeah. to, it's an inner transformation that has to happen. But, you know, disruption uh, to me is a necessary tool Mm. for transformation. Um, And it is um, one of the drivers of imagination, right? In order to imagine something different or outside of what you know, there has to be a breaking up of something that you already know. The, the, The calcification of thought has to be disrupted. Um, So that's the way we have stuff up, right? Um, There is a a whole lot of work going on right now, as you know, in New Orleans around criminal legal system and juvenile justice Um, and needing to take a deep look at how we handle these issues and how we're treating our children, right? Um, That's one of the things that I'm really working to sort of to crack and, and break down and to disrupt and to not rebuild it the same way, but to build something different. Right. There has to be a different way that we need to proceed. Right. Now, I, I love that thinking about the calcification of thought. Yeah. Right. You know, I, I forget that I'm talking to Dr. David Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, but it, it, it's interesting because you think of the imagery, mm-hmm. right, of, of calcification, something that is calcified. It, it has become hardened. Right. Yeah. We think about plaque in our bodies. Right. Plaque is 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 calcium buildup of calcium that blocks. Right. And you think about pebbles in a river. Right. Pebbles that calcify together become boulders. Mm -hmm. Right. Boulders become barriers. And what do you have to do for change is that hopefully, hopefully you can dismantle the pebbles. But when they become boulders, you have to take sledgehammers. You have you you have to take sledgehammers to systems to break them up. And I and I, yeah. I, I love that to basically think about how do we decalcify systems in order to live this fullness of being human, right? Yeah. And I, I, that that's at the center of, of this. And so yeah. effing things up. And you talked about the beginning of this, and this happens so often in my show, like breaking things up usually begins with us as the yeah. initial human. Mm-hmm. What does that look like for you as you're doing this work, right? How do you start with decalcifying us as humans? Because we are the harbingers of systems that cause inequities. Yes. Yes. That's the million dollar question, Charles. (laughs) That's the million dollar question. But how do we begin to transform ourselves to transform everything else? Right. If systems are composed of human beings, then the humans have to transform for the system to be changed. Um, for me, it's about awareness, a recognition that there is an issue and that we are uh, players in the system. All of us, no matter which side we are, we're on, no matter um, how we are embodied in this world, that we participate in these systems. And until we change, there will be no change. A, a key part of that is is helping people to understand that, which is very anti sort of Western, right? That I don't need your acceptance about what I'm going to talk to you about today, right? I need your understanding. And the Buddhists say understanding is love by another name, mm. right? So I need us to practice love in this space. In fact, I don't want you to agree with me because it makes the dialogue that much richer. So we have this awareness building through dialogue, right? And uh, the modeling of compassion right? With other people and with ourselves. And the self-compassion is the hardest compassion to model, right? Because mm. we have some ugly little inner dialogues um, <laughs> that are always at play. Um, oh, wait, those, li- those limits and beliefs can, look, can sidetrack you, put you on the sideline, yes. make you, make yes. you be RG3. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that's where we start, right? We start with modeling compassion, empathy, 
and love for other people um, and for ourselves. And then we, we spread out from there. But I'm going to say but, right? I'm, I'm yeah, going to yeah. say but, right? Because you and I understand those thoughts and we work, we work yeah. day in and day out about empathy and compassion and love, not only for ourselves, but for others, right? Yeah. But David, we, David, <laughs> <laughs> right? David, brother, yeah. Yeah. empathy, <laughs> compassion and love, yeah. right? For those, for those, for those people, they, that, that sounds like weakness, right? I, why do I need yeah. to be empathetic? Right. Why do I need to show compassion? Right. I don't I don't think the way that you think. I don't really care about what you think. Right. I'm an individual. I'm sitting in my camp with my folks. I don't like you. I don't like what you got to say. Why do I need to show empathy, compassion and love for you? Because that's what I'm seeing in our country right now. We are entrenched. Yeah. Right. And there's another question on the other side of this because I, I, I want to get. But we are entrenched in our camps. And you're like, you know what? I'm going to sit over here. And I'm going to show empathy, compassion, and love to people who, who side with me, who think like me, who mm -hmm. look like me, for the most part. Yeah. So how do you navigate that, David? Dr. David? Well, again, million dollar question. Um, the answer for me is that you keep doing the work, right? The, someone else's reaction to the work that you're called to do is none of your responsibility, mm. right? Um, you know what you have to do until you keep doing it. And uh, until we understand in this country in particular that uh, what one person does affects all of us, right? We have to get out of this atomistic individualist thinking, right? That we are a community. And if you shoot me in the toe, somebody else's toe is going to hurt down the road, right? It, it is a ripple effect. Mm. Um, but we're not thinking in terms of the whole. We're thinking in terms of our um, very sorted, classified communities, right? And it's happening all over. There's a really good book, somewhere on a bookshelf by Bill Bishop called The Big Sort. Um, and what, what Bill Bishop said 10 years ago was that he saw communities moving into, right, these political factions, that neighborhoods are becoming all red or all blue, right? Uh, they're becoming all white are all black um, and that this was going to be the detriment of this country. Mm. Right. Because we don't understand that we're all in it together. Yes. Yeah. That we're all, that we're all in this together, yeah. you know, and I, 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 I was talking to a couple of my military friends and we were having this conversation and I asked them, I was like, what's going to bring us back together. And many of them said, it's going to take an attack or a catastrophe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is that, that comes from another country, right? That we have to that we're going to have to go through some turmoil and devastation yeah. that galvaniz galvanizes us back together. Because remember, at least in the initial months and you know maybe a year, year and a half after nine mm -hmm. eleven, I even remember like I I'm American. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like <laughs> you attacked you attacked our country. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. You you attacked my country, and I I remember on my street on Green River there was a the, a, a policeman from Boston mm. who draped this large American flag, you know, down his house, you know, yeah. two story house. It's big, and I was like, every time I came home, I was like, yes, right. I'm an American. You yeah. attack my people, you know. I'm angry. But that began to dissipate, yeah. not from not 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 about my Americanism, but the the togetherness, the we're in this together. Right. And then 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 what happened was we became factional. Well, the the Muslims attacked us, so we're going to hate the Muslims. We've been disliking mm -hmm. Jews, so you know we're gonna we're gonna amp that up. All, all of a sudden, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we got too many people coming across the border, right? Yeah. There, right, and and not seeing that. If we are, if we think about this, right, what, what Dr. David Robinson Moore says, if we think about this, that we're humans, mm -hmm. right, that no immigrant is illegal, that all people are humans, if we begin to think like that, dear brother, where could we be? Oh, you know, and, and, and yeah. so that, that's, that's the interesting thing is moving in this space where we can think about 
we're all in this together. So the strategy mm -hmm. is because like, I have people who listen to the show who are in various industries. You know, I have DEI practitioners like yourself and others across the country who are working in these spaces. What do you say to them when they're walking into spaces and it's, it is tense? It is controversial. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're trying to make headways within their companies, within their organizations. What do you say to them as they're trying to make inroads and trying to get them to think about we're all in this together? Yeah. Yeah. I say you have to have your own practice, right? You have to have your own way of stealing yourself, not stealing, but still be still, right? To go inside, to go internal and to understand that, again, the work you have been called to do is your work. And uh, one, someone's reaction to your work, again, is none of your concern. Once you hear something, you cannot unhear it. This is what I tell people all the time. I'll go into a workshop and I understand they don't want to hear a word I have to say. Right? But once you've heard it, you can't unhear it. Now, it's up to you to do what you're going to do with it. But I've done my work. Right? And I have to let it go. The, the thing about diversity work in general um, and I want to go back to something you said before I go there. I want to go back to something you said around 9-11, right? The human condition is such that we only, the majority of the time, humans only learn through pain, mm. right? We learn through suffering, not through joy. Um, and so this, this notion that something that is going to cause suffering is going to bring us back together again is very, is very human. Um, and it is a core sort of tenet of, of the human condition, right? We, we center ourselves around this collective and shared pain instead of collective and shared joy, mm. right? Um, and so it, it, it saddens me that that's the case. Um, it also tells me that, um, and I believe that rage is righteous and anger is a transformative energy, right? But if you hang on to it, it becomes destructive. Right. Um, and so we, we all the way through and release. Yes, that's it. That's it. That's it. Now, back to your original question, right? For folks who are going into these hostile spaces, know what your work is. Know that, know what you, you're being asked to do, right? Mm -hmm. So I took a job recently at uh, a large healthcare company. <laughs> I lasted all of six months. <laughs> ahead, we won't say we won't say, we won't say what that healthcare company is. Right. But I, 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 I know exactly who they are. I I lasted all six months. I knew on day one that it wasn't for me. Right? If my revolution is to go in and f stuff up, I understood that that was not the place to f it up. It was needed, <laughs> right? Um, but I would encounter, which I'm okay with most days, encounter a whole lot of opposition. Mm -hmm. um, and corporate opposition is sometimes more lethal than political opposition. Mm. What do you mean by that? Right? Well, you know, corporations create themselves for their own institutions in general, right? Are created for their own survival. And so if you are running counter to their survival, or they feel like you're trying to kill them in the way they operate, you have to go first, right? <laughs> oh, by any yeah. means necessary. Uh, by any means necessary. Exactly. Um, and so what I realized walking into that space was, oh, they don't really want this. And obviously when they hired me, they didn't really look me up. <laughs> right? Because you about to bring a revolution into yes. this space. <laughs> they wanted none of it. But what I right? And my work for as long as I was there was to F stuff up. And to help folks understand who are folks who are suffering, who look like me, who are suffering, that they were not alone and that they were seen. And so for six months, that's what I did. Right. It is important, right, for you to understand what you're being asked to do. So one of the key questions I had from a mentor when I called to talk about this job was, what did they ask you to transform? Mm. And I said, nothing. And her response was, then go sit your ass down. <laughs> and I was like, ah, okay, this isn't about transformation. This is about performativity. This is about black faces uh, on a poster 
saying we have this DEI thing, right? And we're we're doing it, which means they're not doing anything. Mm. Now that's not me, so I couldn't survive in that environment. You, you you couldn't survive in a performative space, which happens which happens a lot. You know, I've been having this conversation, and thank you for sharing that. Having this conversation with a lot of DEI practitioners, and, and and typically they're like, if I don't report to the CEO, they don't value this. If I'm not if I don't have a seat at the at the the big boys and girls table. They don't value this. Yeah. If they want me to do a Black History Month with celebrating Dr. Martin Luther King, and they don't look, I don't see them any other time of the year, right? right. They're not really into this. Yeah. And that's the interesting thing. And for me, revolutionaries, you know, I used to be in this space and I got out because of, hey, let's bring Dr. Corporal in to check the box, right? Mm -hmm. Let, let's do the let's do this kumbaya and bring us together and then see you, Dr. Corporal. We'll pay you this money, but peace, right? right? And I'm talking about what are the policies, practices, and programs that you got going on that are going to impact your people long after I'm gone, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To f stuffed up to revolutionize institutions, as we say, right? To yeah. reimagine, yeah. right? And to give a revolution to them, <laughs> you got to blow them up. Yes, yes. 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 Which means you're going to blow up the situation of the people in power. And that in itself, right there, <laughs> as we see. And, and it's interesting you say that. Because working in venture capital for the last three years mm -hmm. and knowing that the influx of capital goes to white men and white folks. Yeah. And to shift that, there's a report that came out, you know, after it, you know, there was, you know, you, you, we, we've had this conversation. George Floyd is the watershed moment in history over the last, mm -hmm. what, 100 years, right? Mm -hmm. At least the last 50 years, right? The watershed moment of our lifetime. I, I, I'll put it that way. And everybody wanted to, everybody wanted to shift. They wanted to be a part of this. But one of the last bastions where diversity did not shift was in venture capital. Mm -hmm. Firms are still not diverse. Capital is still not flowing as much out to black and women entrepreneurs across the country. Yeah. And if you listen to what Dr. David Robinson Morrison just said, revolutionaries, is that you gotta blow up the power structures. Mm -hmm. And the power structures in this space have the most money in the world. Yeah. You're not blowing, you, you, you look, <laughs> if you can't blow up the money space, you're not blowing up anything. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so that that's the thing. I didn't mean to, you know, uh, clearly I get a little excited when you say no, that. Man. <laughs> 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 but just fight on. Just fight on, right? If you follow the money, you know where you know what's happening. And those industries that took up the DEI mantle, which they will put back down pretty soon, to be quite honest. Yeah. We can mm -hmm. talk about that. Um those industries that took up the mantle took it up not because it was the right thing to do, but because it was going to impact their bottom line. Right, right, right. And and now I'm I'm essentializing that right. Not all of them, but the majority of them did it for that reason. And we know that because they have not changed their policy or their practice, and they have not created equity within their institution. Right. Um, so you you see this this influx of things happening with the murder of George Floyd. Um, and I, I had a conversation with someone recently and I said, you know, our greatest model for this is post reconstruction South, the South post reconstruction. Look at what happened. Reconstruction, we had black men being elected to state houses Right? We had black ownership and wealth. We had integrated school districts. We had all of these things. Post-Reconstruction, we usher in a Jim Crow era. Mm. The backlash. Just, backlash. Yeah. And, that's, and, yeah. and that's, that's what scares me right now. That, that, yeah. that is what scares me. And we are five and a half years, five years post-Obama. Mm-hmm. And what we've seen in those five years, right? If George Floyd doesn't happen, what if George Floyd does not happen, 
the conversations that we're having, right? Would we be having them? Would we be having them? Where would where would our systems be without him? And and that's that's martyrdom right there. Mm -hmm. That's because you think five years post Obama, four years of Trump and Trumpism, which still continues, right? Mm -hmm. This nationalist surge still continues in our, you know, we, we're still swimming in nationalism and it's growing yeah. and yeah. it's growing. And we've got to continue to fight, mm -hmm. like literally fight in every industry, in every sector, in every place. Yeah to find equity, to find yeah. not equality, because that's, that's been an interesting conversation, doc, mm -hmm. is that I've had people say, I don't believe in equity. I believe in equality. And, and, and like, what? Right. Like, right. Equality is, ah, uh, so. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it makes no sense, right? You, you. When they say that, it is. I don't believe in giving you what you need to be whole. Mm. I believe in giving you what what I need for you to be whole, like me, right? Which is complete two different things. Two different things. Two different things because you still have a group of people who are not whole in this equality debate. Right. Equity is about wholeness. Revolution, I want you to, I want you to hear that again. Equity is about wholeness. If you were if you if we're running a race, right, <laughs> you and I are running, you and I are running a race. I wear a size nine, ten, depending on the shoe. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not wearing Dr. David Robinson's Morris shoe to run that race with him. Right. 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 <laughs> Everybody who runs a marathon has different shoe sizes, right? Yeah. They're different shoes, but they're all competing in the same race, right? Yeah. What makes them whole in this space is because they have been able to personalize what they need to be successful. Yeah. And by showing, as we talked about earlier, Doc, empathy, compassion, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and love. We figure out that an equitable space actually allows us to be better with each yeah. other. Yeah. What, I, I want to move this conversation because uh, Dr. David Robinson Morris is, is one of those um, uber intellectuals, right? If you, know, if you, thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, and I want people to go check him out. You know, please go to Dr. Dr. MPHD dot com, right? And, and and check out my good friend, you know, and, and all of the, the, the luminary works that he's done over the years working in this space. He's an uber intellectual, right? Who studies, and, and I want to, I'm going to look directly at him when I say this, right? What it means to be a human being. Mm. And my revolutionaries look at me like, I know what that means. I know what it means to be a human being. I look at myself every day, right? This is what it means to be a human being. I'm going to assume, Dr. David Robinson Morris, is that there's a deeper understanding of what it means to be a human being. So I would love to hear, I would love to hear your take on and what you found about the human existence and what it means to be a human being. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's an ongoing process, right? It, it is a um, it's a journey of discovery, uh, and what I say is that we won't know what it really means to, to be a human being until we cease to live in this body, um, right? Until we come to the fullness of our understanding of our time here on Earth, uh, then maybe I'll have a real glimpse of what it means to be a human being, right? But from my perspective, I study um, that question from the perspective of socially engaged Buddhism and Ubuntu, uh, which is uh, South African communalism, right? I am because we are. And so to be a human being is the understanding that you are not born human, but you are made human in relationship with other human beings, mm -hmm. right? Um, there was a really wonderful movie, it wasn't that wonderful, but it came out of the 90s with Jodie Foster called Nail. Um, and Nell, that. you remember that movie? Nell was yeah. raised by a pack of wolves. Yes, I remember that. Right? The best illustration. 
Nell thought because she was raised by a pack of wolves that she was a wolf. Right? Nell was born into the human family but was not born a human being. Right? Because of her relationship with the wolf, she was a wolf. And so to understand that our being on this earth is a communal undertaking and an engagement with everything we see and don't see, the seen and the unseen, right? It comes from a very African cosmology, but where we understand everything to be a glimpse of God, right? Um, and that all things are in communion with all things. And that that's how we form this world in ourselves, right? So to be a human being um, is not only that, but it's also the practice of love, right? It's the practice of compassion, it's joy, it's equanimity, it is um, peace, it's war, um, it's a battle. Human, uh, being human, I tell people all the time, like healing is a battle, mm. right? Now the end result, I hope, is peace, joy, love, compassion, and hope, um, but not always. Being human is a battle. Mm. A a battle. Uh, and you, what I'm, I think that I'm hearing is that being human is a battle to find peace, love, joy, hope, happiness, and fullness. And fullness. Yeah. And and, and fullness because I, I I I'm thinking about this right. I I'm 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 letting this I'm I'm letting this flow from the top of my <laughs> the top of my head all the way down. Yeah. to my feet and, and, and I, I'm thinking about being human and at this at this age right at this mm. at this standing age <laughs> as we talked about <laughs> earlier in the show at, at this at this standing age yeah. do I feel human mm. do I feel a sense of fullness do I feel a sense of hope and joy and compassion yes yes I do yeah. and yes Yes, it is a battle. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. Talk about this battle, right? Because I, I want people to internalize this, Doc. Yeah. What does that battle look like? Mm. Well, it looks different for every person. Um, you know, if, if we understand, so my understanding of, of my beingness on this planet, right, is that um, taken from uh, Chardon, who says, uh, we are spiritual beings having a human experience, right? Not the other way around. Not human beings having a spiritual experience. So if I understand that my being on this planet is embodied, is a spirit that is embodied, then I understand that I've come here to learn and to teach, right? And that is, is a battle. Learning and teaching are both battles, right? They are both... Um, they're both engaging engagements with something that is unknown, right? Towards an act of transformation. And so every person's teaching and learning looks different based on, if, again, if you believe in this sort of understanding that we are spiritual beings, based on what their soul was sent here to learn or to teach, right? So uh, in this life, um, maybe my battle, right, is to understand um, my own brilliance, <laughs> right? Um, and I say that because it's very hard for me to say that out loud. Um, mm. And I don't believe that, right? Those nasty little thoughts, uh, those, those little voices believe. back here. Yeah. Right. Um, maybe it's for me to sit in conversation with you today and talk about what does it mean to be a revolutionary, right? What does it mean um, to revolutionize? So everybody's battle is different. Uh, but what we know is that there are some commonalities in the human condition, right? That no matter who we are, we experience love. We experience mm -hmm. joy. We experience pain. We experience pleasure. We will experience grief at some point. We will experience death and dying at some point. These are commonalities across the human condition, right? Uh, and for those of us who are lucky, we will grow old. Yeah. Right. Um, not everybody has that privilege. So those are 
lessons in each one of those stages of our lives. And my grandmother, God bless her, would always say, you will continue to encounter this thing until you learn the lesson. You cannot <laughs> move on from it, right? Um, so those lessons are important. Those mm -hmm. battles are important. You, look, you see him, look, you see him a little, give <laughs> wait, 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 this is a TV show. <laughs> give me a little, give me a little, let me go to the other side. Give me a little, give me a little side. <laughs> your, your grandmother was a sage, let me tell you, you know, I, um, I have, um, I'm sure that I have uh, an IG folder with all, all of these, um, monumental slogans or monumental slate sayings right mm -hmm. and i know that one of them says that you will continue to encounter the same situations until you have learned the lesson right mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i keep saying and i keep saying to myself right this human existence this human condition the charles corporal experience right right like you look just like the same way person that just left yes right <laughs> wait <laughs> Wait. <laughs> yes. You ain't learned you ain't learned the yes, you haven't you learned, learned the lesson. <laughs> you ain't learned the lesson yet, right? <laughs> this battle of the human existence. If we hear what my good friend Dr. David Robinson Morris is saying, is that the human experience, what it means to be human is to battle to get to a point of love, compassion, joy, empathy, happiness, mm -hmm. fullness. Mm -hmm. But it is a battle. And I think about right. I, I think about this. You, you you think about if New Orleans was a person, <laughs> yeah. David. Yeah, yeah. The New Orleans human existence, like I, it has been battling. Yeah. Right. Shout out. You know. Shout out to our our New Orleanians, the, our our beloved city. You know, yeah. uh, as it experiences one of the most reverent times of his existence, Mardi Gras. Mm hmm. But think about this as, as a city and, and people who live in the city, who love the city. New Orleans battles year after year after year for its existence, right? Yeah. For its humanity. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and thinking about that, and, and, and I'm thinking about this, if we even put this in, if we juxtapose this into this individualism of black masculinity. Mm. Mm-hmm. The human experience, what it means to be human, this battle that black men have been going through since the since since the existence, since the existence. And I'll even say this battle for humanity in this country. Uh oh, I feel it coming on. I, I, I feel I, right, I feel it. Excuse me, revolutionaries. Um, the battle for human existence in this country. Time and time again, just to get to, to the point that we can have the fullness of the human existence to experience un 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 unbridled joy and it, it, you, the, the hashtag black boy joy yeah to find empathy for the people who don't look like us because we have to be and our sisters have to be some of the most empathetic folks doc yeah. right come on yeah. to the cookout i know i know you just said some shit about me but you can come right. to the cookout you know what I'm yeah. saying? Because I'm trying to find, look, I'm trying to build bridges instead of break them down, right? Yeah. I'm trying to build bridges instead of burn them down, right? Yeah. Build buildings and not burn them down. I want to sit at the table and find joy and conversation and community with you instead mm -hmm. of discourse and discord. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's, it's so that that is the interesting thing. And so I, I guess because I want my revolutionaries to hear strategy and tips, how do we as men yeah find solace in this battle david yeah and i'm gonna start yeah. with that how do you find solace in this battle how do i find solace in this battle you know what comes to mind is um there there's a scripture be transformed by the renewing of your mind mm -hmm. <laughs> right um that this sort of the sustenance, right? How do you sustain yourself in a daily battle is by the renewing of your mind. Mm. Um, and I would add, once you renew your mind, your ass will follow. <laughs> right? um, 
you will move differently in the world. I am sustained by an understanding that African people in the diaspora, we are the people of humanity's birth. We are. Right? All life comes from the continent. And as, again, my dear grandmother would say, we had a conversation around Catholicism once, we race Catholic, and she said, she said something to me, and I was like, oh, well, Jesus wouldn't want that. And she said, um, our people existed before the concept of Jesus. Mm. And I said, okay. And she said, uh, we can trace our, our ancestor back to God herself our original ancestor back to God herself. And so to have that understanding, right, allows for this generosity of spirit, allows for this openness, allows for us to be able, in some instances, to hold things on by it, right? But also Ubuntu, this notion of communalism, this notion that we are together, I, I argue in all of my work is the the one of the remaining things that has sustained black people in this country since we were stolen from the continent it's the one thing that has remained with us this notion that we are in it together yeah, we are in and it I, together. I may not like you at all i may not be able to even look at you most days but what i do know is that my survival is based on your survival right and vice versa. And so we're in it together. Now, black, black masculinity, you know, has in a number of ways, in my opinion, in this country, been deeply perverted. Mm, yes. And right? that, you know, to be a black man, in my opinion, is to be whole, is to be full, is to be self-actualized on the road to it is to be aware of your emotions, is to be embodied, and to understand that we have an embodied knowing that guides us through the world, right? Um, and that we cannot take on being human like our white counterparts. Right. Right? Because there's a whole lot of trauma there that white whiteness has not dealt with, but they are uh, projecting onto other people. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have to understand that, of course, we will experience trauma, but we have to process that pain, right, and put it into good use. Pain, anger, rage can be righteous. Right. And so, how do we put that in? Uh, how, how does that become fuel for our work together? Together. Uh, and that's together. That in itself is an interesting thing because when we look at the emotions of pain, uh, what the pain is the pain. Pain is actually the the physical manifestation of our uh, our our emotions, our our, our mental mm -hmm. aspects. Um, but anger and disappointment, and I, I think about you know <sighs> sadness that goes a part of this human existence as we fight in in this battle. But how do we use this? What you're saying is, how do we use this in a in a manner that is going to fuel our revolution? If we put it into yeah. context, that it yeah. and that it doesn't dismantle us, yeah. because what we're seeing that 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 sadness and anger and the physical man the the pain, even the emotional pain, can dismantle us, can dismantle yeah. communities, yeah. can dismantle this country. Yeah. And that's what we're and that's actually what we're seeing right now is that we are a country at battle because we're in pain. And this feeling, this feeling of brokenness yeah. that we have, and that I must the way to fix my brokenness, Doc, is that I must entrench myself. I have these staunch beliefs, and this entrenchment will make me whole. Yeah. When in fact this entrenchment will actually continue to break us down and that pain will continue time and time and time again. Yeah. Yeah. The simplest of what Dr. Davis and Roberts, David Roberts, David, <laughs> David Robinson Morris, we're going to get to how you got this full name in a second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is saying that revolutionaries, 
look across the street, look across the table, right? Figure out how you can reach that hand out, right? Instead of putting that hand in your pocket, revolutionaries. How can you figure out how you can revolutionize things together? There is a common place for us. We are in this together. We are in yeah. this together. Whew, man, that's that's why I love to do this show, brother. <laughs> You're good at it. You, this is great. I'm like, I, we can have this conversation every day, John. I love it. Man, look, that, it. That, look. This is what I need. This is this this is this is the elixir. This is this is the you know that keeps me going when I get to have these powerful conversations with people who are much much smarter than me. You know, I don't and, know that. <laughs> uh, look, look, look. You would win at Jeopardy every night. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I love that. What is the, what is the moon to? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> what is Sal <South> Bona? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I love it. You know, um, Doc. I want to just just a couple of things before before we yeah. go before we go. You know, we talk about our beloved city. You know, mm -hmm. New Orleans, and what it what mm -hmm. it means to both of us. Not what is meant to us. What yeah. it means to us. What has to happen in New Orleans for it to thrive? Mm. You know, I I think um, I think first we have to call on the ancestors, um, and I tell people all the time that the air in New Orleans is thick with the ancestors. Mm. You feel them, right, um, and they're ever present. But I don't know if we've called on them. I don't know if we've asked for the help that we need. Um, I think New Orleans, uh, in my opinion, needs a healing, right? Um, and it needs uh, this sort of deep level of transformation. You know, the, the interesting thing about New Orleans, and people hate when I say this, and I'm probably going to get a whole lot of flack about it, right? But it began as a rogue colony, as a rogue French colony. There's a wonderful book by Shannon Doherty, um, who is that UNO, an anthropologist from UNO for a long time called Building the Devil's Empire. Mm, okay. uh, and it talks about co French colonial New Orleans at its beginning. Um, and what she details for us is that New Orleans become, is a prison colony, essentially, for France. Right? And so what was happening in 17, whenever we were founded, 300 years ago, is actually still happening today. Mm. Right now, the players look different, um, but in in a number of cases, the blood is still the same. Wow, wow! Right, so you see history repeating itself over and over and over again because we haven't disrupted it in a way that will help it to transform itself. Um, so I think that that's a big part of it. Uh, our political system in New Orleans, as you very well know, is shot. <laughs> it's just shot. Um, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. This it is makes a city of have and have not. Yes. The tale and of two cities. The tale of two cities. And it, it, until we transform those things, and until we, black folks in this town, get together in a real way and stop playing crabs in a bucket, and develop real political power and develop real economic power, right? And and stop being sharecroppers in the plantation town, because that's where we are right now. Right. Um, then we won't see the necessary transformation for people of African descent in this in this town. Um, I feel our beloved city is, you know, is fighting. Uh, it, 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 it is battling for its existence yeah. and yeah. our young brothers and sisters are battling in a sense right now in a manner that is deleterious, right? Yeah. Uh, for the, for their longevity and for the longevity of the city. And as you said, that there, there has to be. And I, I bring this up revolutionaries because I'm always an ardent supporter of my second home, mm -hmm. right? The love that new Orleans gave for me while I was there and the love that I have for it. Right. The revolutionary that I am right now is because of New Orleans and its yeah. people. And I will always, always, always be a supporter and lover. <laughs> and, and I say that and I say that in the most you know, intimate way 
of New Orleans, right? Yeah. Uh, that it is a part of my blood. And so I wish you, as you do that wonderful work in our city, you know, as you, as you battle for humanity in New Orleans, yeah. as you battle for humanity, not only there, but across the country, across the region, around yeah. promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion, about getting folks to really think about their human humanity and their human existence and what it means to live together. It, it, it doesn't have to be in harmony all the time, yeah. Yeah. but to find harmony in spaces where discord may happen, yeah. that we can work together regardless of all of the, all, all of the creeds, religions, races, whatever, we can categorize ourselves into to say, ultimately, you are human, I am human, and our existence depends, as Dr. David Robinson Morris says, on each other. Yeah. I want you to understand that, revolutionaries. Yeah. Last question, right? I've never yeah. asked this question to my good friend. I've never asked this question. <laughs> what is the story about the Robinson Morris? The Robinson Morris, well, my, my crazy mother. Um, before I go into Robinson Morris, I wonder what's popping into my head is a, is a wonderful, um, someone read to me a quote from a, uh, an older woman in a war-torn country in Europe. And she said, uh, until we love our children, as much as we love our enemies, we will not know peace. Mm. And we think about that in this context of Ukraine and Russia, like that has right. taken over the news. Imagine if that was our, we, we focused on our children and their wholeness and fullness that much, right? Um, maybe we would know some peace. Um, that started popping to my head. But the, the Robinson Marsh, my mother tells, uh, my mother, uh, who is no longer with us, who left us two years ago and is joined the land of the ancestors, would tell the story. Um, it is, Robinson is her last name, Morris is my dad's last name. And she hyphenated the last name for herself because she said it, she knew it wasn't gonna last and it would be easier to cut the bastard off. <laughs> um, so <laughs> that's the story of Robinson Morris. It, it's a way to honor, really it's a way to honor both sides of our family. The Robinson side does not have very many men. Mm. Um, and so it was a way to carry on that name and legacy of uh, my great grandfather, C.C. Robinson, who was himself a revolutionary in his time. He was um, the first vice president of the NAACP for the state of Texas from 1955 to 1985. Wow. Um, and the president of the mainland branch in Texas for just about as long. Um, but uh, had his own sort of, was instrumental in, uh, in bringing sort of civil rights and equality at that point, equality, uh, right, into the landscape in uh, Southeast Texas. So it's a way to honor both sides. Nice. Yeah. I love that. You know, names mean a lot. And, yeah. you know, I, I think about Corpru and I think about Charles, Charles yeah. Corpru, uh, the lineage of that being the third and, and, and holding up that name. And trying to figure out how that seed is going, how that name is going to, you know, as we talked about in the green room, but that's for another day. Yeah. <laughs> Dear brother, I just want to tell you that I love you. I, I am I grateful you, for yeah. you. Uh, our friendship means so much to me and seeing you and, and, and doing the work, you know, all the text messages about our friend. Thank you for the consoling. <laughs> I appreciate it. You know who you are. <laughs> You know, all, all the consoling, uh, you know, uh, I'll send you wine and a wedding present. Better <laughs> <So. laughs> next time, Charles. Better exactly, next time. exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, but brother, I, I wish you well. Uh, right. Revolutionaries, please go to, let me make sure that I get it correct. If you want to check out um, drmphd.com to check out this wonderful Dr. W. Robinson, David W. Robinson Morris, PhD, and all the amazing work that he is doing across the world, allowing us to be human, to have a human existence for everyone to feel like they can be full. So thank you for your time, dear brother. I wish you well. I wish you well. And revolutionaries, 
you know what you know what I'm about to tell you. Look, figure out that revolution. Answer that question. And if you need help, we are right here for you. We'll talk to you soon. I love you all. Peace.